We're going to get started when the mayor turns his microphone on. We're going to have the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Doug Servant is the pastor at City Presbyterian Church. He'll lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Greenwell if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But at this time, would everyone please stand? Thank you, council members and guests. It is great to be here. We at City Presbyterian Church pray for you. We have as our motto, love God, love people, and love the city. And so we love what's going on, and we want it, it's Oklahoma City to flourish. I'm going to read just two quick texts and pray for us. Isaiah 43, uh, written 3,000 years ago, a prophet said this, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In times like our weekends, we need to remember that evil will not win. And we stand for truth and mercy justice and love. 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth said these words, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning asking you to bless these deliberations, these decisions, these men and women, these brothers and sisters who represent the people of this city. We pray for that flourishing. We pray for that shalom to come to all in our city. And we ask that you would work as we seek justice, as we love mercy and we walk humbly with you. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Please face the flag. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get started today, I wanna to draw attention to a, a big day that's coming up on Thursday. Uh, to the city manager, did you know that your 30th anniversary is coming up in two days? 30 years? Uh, no. You didn't? Well, um, I'm going to give you something today. This is a, a pen that is presented to any city employee that can survive 30 years inside our <laughs> confines. Now, almost all of them work for you. Uh, but in, in this case, the council and I wanted to ha you to have this. And uh, don't lose it before Thursday, because it's really not official. But we had the council meeting here. And I know the council and I want to start off a round of applause for you. <laughs> You're up. <laughs> your, uh, your entire leadership team is here, and, you, and your wife is embedded on row three over there. I don't know if you knew it, that she had slipped into the room. I think a speech is in order, personally. Uh, well, the reason I've been here as long as I have as city manager for 17 years is because of the, of the mayor and council. The leadership that you show the civility that we have here on difficult decisions every week is the reason that it's a, we're able to, to move forward on it. And, and we have tough decisions, but we deal with them in a, in a very professional and, and, and civil manner. And I think the rest of the country, I think the state capitol and clearly Washington could take an example for how we, how we conduct government here in Oklahoma City. And because of that, I, I, I'm able to, uh, to benefit from that. So I want to thank all of you. And then, of course, the other thing that we have here that's unique to Oklahoma City that a lot of people don't understand is the unique relationship between we have and the business community here. 
we work in a, in a joint effort to get things accomplished, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's the developers with impact fees, whether that it's the taxi drivers about Uber. We've got a lot of things that we, we work together to come up with positive solutions as we go forward. And it's that attitude that moves Oklahoma City forward. And I appreciate all of you very much. So thank you. And, and now you're going to say it's done really fast in 30 years? <laughs> Parts of it. Yeah. <laughs> I asked him if it had gone fast. He said parts of it, for 30 years, <laughs> have gone fast. Well, Jim, I know I, the, I, I speak for the council when I say we, we, we feel like we're the best city management in the entire country. And uh, this city often receives praise and acknowledgement. And if we don't say it out loud, we should. We, we, uh, we, we know that much of that uh, credit and success uh, is, is due to your work. So thank you. Well, and, and, the, and the team here, too. Every city employee that's dedicated to our goal. but. But my executive team, my, my assistant city managers and the department heads are, are excellent. And, 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 I, and you can prove that by, by the lack of turnover that we have. If you take a, a, a look at it, I mean, M.T. Berry's been here for, I think, 137 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, why don't we have the city staff that are in the room today stand that so would be we great. can acknowledge you as well. Thank you all very much. All right, we're going to get to item three of the council agenda. Item three is a, is a series of appointments. I'll take a motion on the first four, and then we'll wait on the, 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 the students. All right, cast your votes. Items pass unanimously. Um, now we're going to have uh, the, the youth council that is here with us today. This is the class of 2017, 2018, and they are going to stand behind their prospective council representative. And we'll have a little ceremony and a chance to meet these young people. Mayor, as they're taking their places, I'd like to introduce Joyce Henderson and Rick Kane, who are the program co-chairs for this year's Youth Council. Thank you. turned on there we go yeah. is Erica Brown uh, she attends Mount St. Mary High School and she's the class of 2018 and and I thought this was interesting I got to visit with Erica a little this morning she's she's a senior there she was elected secretary of her school's key club uh, not only last year but also for her senior year and Erica is vice president of the Oklahoma Eating Disorders Association teen board she also volunteers at the pet and people animal shelter and Erica identifies mental illness and education is two issues that the youth of Oklahoma City um, are facing more and more. And so I would like to welcome Erica here today, and I'd like to at this time give you an, a pin uh, and, as a part of our team. Yeah. Uh, the next person that I'd like to introduce is Josephine Nwanko, and she is from Putnam City North High School, and she's right behind me here, waved to everybody. She is also the class of 2018. Uh, she uh, is a member of the Key Club of her school, and through that has volunteered at numerous places and events throughout the city. She is a current member of the Children's Miracle Network uh, Teen Board, and is a representative of her class uh, student council. Joseph Bele Josephine believes there are several issues that are the youth of Oklahoma City are facing today, such issues as drug use, uh, dropout rates, uh, obesity, and um, she encourages um, people to have better access, uh, learn more about uh, what it takes to remain in school and their, the chances for success if you remain in school, better access to gyms, and to try to uh, influence teenagers to have healthier food options. Um, Josephine, we want to welcome you here today, and here's your pen. Congratulations. Thanks for being a part of the team. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ward 7, uh, we have Chase uh, Coleman. Uh, Chase is a junior from Millwood High School. He is a member of the Principal's Honor Roll and is a representative of his class in Student Council. Last year, he was a member of the 2A State champion football team at Millwood. Hopefully we can do that again. Uh, <laughs> Chase volunteers at his church as a mentor for children and by assisting adult leaders. He is a co-owner of his own line business, Coleman Landscaping. Two issues Chase believes, believes youth of Oklahoma City are facing are school funding and opportunity awareness. He believes these issues uh, could be addressed by uh, compressing schools and speed and spreading awareness of all positive things to do uh, in Oklahoma City. Next we have Alina Wilson. Alina is a junior from Heritage Hall High School. She participates in varsity soccer, softball, and basketball. She consistently has landed on the headmaster's list for her academic achievements and is a member of the Challenge Artists Program, the Spanish Club, the Diversity Club, Service Learning Council, Hall of Representative Club, and many, many more. This past year, she co-founded the Adopt Grandparent Program where students are paired with elderly at nearby nursing home. Alina works well with others because she understands when it's time to stop talking and listening to others. And I think uh, our folks at the state capitol in uh, Washington, D.C. need to take note of that. Um, Alina identifies obesity as a top issue facing her peers. She believes educating families on the importance of health and fitness is key uh, to turning things uh, around. Your Honor, today I'll introduce uh, the two youth council from Ward 6 on behalf of Councilwoman Salyer. The first is Miguel Panyan. He is a senior at Aztec Charter High School. Uh, he is a committee chairman for the school's student council and a member of the rowing team. Miguel volunteers at his church as church assistant teacher for youth for his age or younger. He actively volunteers at his local American Red Cross chapter. Miguel believes that two, the two issues the youth of Oklahoma City are facing are people closing doors on each other and the loss of aspiration for improvement. He believes these problems can be addressed by the community being more inclusive and compassionate and by reigniting the youth's aspiration to improve things in the community. Miguel. Congratulations, thank you. The, uh, the other representative for Ward 6 is Ophelia Avila. Avila, thank you. Uh, Ophelia is a senior at Southeast High School. She is preparing for college as a member of Upward Bound, an organization that diversifies learning opportunities for students who plan to attend college after high school. She is actively involved in the LINK crew, uh, mentoring incoming freshmen as they adjust to high school. Ophelia is a member of the National Honor Society and has been on the superintendent's honor roll since her freshman year. She is excited to be a part of the youth council so she can learn about the city and the different career opportunities in Oklahoma City. Ophelia, congratulations, thank you. And now from Ward 5, unfortunately, Christina Delgado was not able to uh, be with us this morning, but I do have Mariano Gonzalez, Jr. And Mariano is a senior at Dove Science Ac Academy. He is a captain of the Ethics Bowl team, who is the first team from Oklahoma to advance to the Nationals. Mariano also served as the page to Senator Kay Floyd he is the chair of events committee, events committee and the community committee for Close Up Model Citizen. Mariano identifies drug and alcohol use 
gangs and violence and wasted ambition as three issues the youth of Oklahoma City faces today. He believes these can be addressed by educating youth about drugs and alcohol, occupying youth with meaningful and constructive activities to keep them out of gangs, and by exposing youth to positive role models and giving them more opportunities to shine in different areas as they may possess, as they may possess talent in. Mariano, congratulations. Thank you. I have two students representing the at-large portion of the, uh, the, the, the Youth Council. Uh, the first is Anna Buckley. Anna is a senior at Cassidy School where she receives high honors for her grades each year. She serves on the discipline committee as a student representative. She also is the social chair, the youth active in the community club. This is a group that encourages all Cassidy students to give back to their community through a variety of service projects. She's been a page at the uh, state level with Representative Cindy Munson, and she's hoping to continue to be involved in politics throughout her life. An issue that she's concerned about her peers is distracted driving. She'd like to see more education and understanding of the consequences on this issue. Anna, congratulations. Also, we have John Ryan Cook. John is a junior from Carl Albert High School. Last year, he was a member of his swim team state champion 400 meter relay team. John was voted president of his school's Keys Club, where he coordinated volunteer events for the year. He's a member of the National Honor Society and the Principal's Honor Roll. He was a member of the Children's Miracle Network's team board for 2016 and 17, and worked with other team members to fundraise and spread awareness for the Children's Hospital. The two issues he believes the youth of Oklahoma City are facing are education and obesity. He would like to make public education a priority and would also like to see the city promote healthy lifestyles. John, this is for you. And uh, let's continue around and then when we're, we're completed the, the round, let's have all the parents stand of these young people. Todd. Thank you, Your Honor. For Ward 4, I would first like to introduce Jake Flaggart. Uh, Jake is a junior at Choctaw High School. He is a representative of his class in his school's student council. Jake is also active at his church, actively participating in the First Baptist Church of Choctaw's Go Group. He is a part of the Health Occupation Students of America and the Kiowanas Key Club. Jake identifies three issues facing the youth of Oklahoma City today as social media abuse, homelessness, and poverty. He believes these can be addressed by informing youth of the negative effects of social media by providing them information on how to properly use it providing youth with programs surrounding the idea of homelessness and how to reduce it, and by partnering up with programs to provide the youth of Oklahoma City with things they may not be able to afford. Jake, congratulations. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Caitlin McClary. Uh, Caitlin is a senior at Crooked Oak High School. She is a part of Crooked Oak's Air Force Junior ROTC program, where she is the highest ranking cadet in her unit and is responsible for all of the cadets as the Cadet Corps Commander. Caitlin works in an after-school program centered around reading to early childhood students. She believes the biggest issues the youth of Oklahoma City face today are centered around education, specifically funding. She believes this problem can be addressed by focusing on increasing funding for public education to try and close the gap between public and private schools. Congratulations. It's my pleasure to introduce the Ward 3 Youth Council for this coming year. Uh, it is uh, Jesus Abanias from Putnam City West High School, where he's a senior. Uh, Jesus uh, also serves in his church as a representative to the uh, council on issues involving the youth in the church. He's uh, involved with La Raza, a club that empowers the Latino population at Putnam City West to volunteer to help other minorities. In his free time, he likes to play the saxophone, spend time with his family. Two issues that he's identified. One is the construction in the city uh, and how that can be an inconvenience to people. So if you have a problem with that from now to the end of the year, just call Jesus, he'll take <laughs> care of it. <coughs> and uh, also education. So congratulations and welcome to the Youth Council. 
And our other youth counselor was not able to be here today, Oscar Larios. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to introduce him at a later time. In Ward 2, we have Jacob uh, Lange, and he's accompanied by his mother and father. He's a senior at Harding Charter Preparatory High School. He's on the speech and debate team and on the principal's honor roll. His two primary issues of concern are teacher pay and uh, the number of emergency certifications. And Jacob, that makes you my new best friend. We have, we have work to do. Angela Bibbs is a, a junior from Northeast Academy. She's the representative of her class in student council. She has a 4.0 GPA. She volunteers at the food bank. And her issues are being less concerned about capital improvements in the school and what the school looks like and uh, more on what goes on inside the classroom and we're also on the same side. So I'll give you guys these. And, and she's accompanied by her mother, sister, and grandmother. Okay. All right. The, uh, Ward 1 representatives, uh, the first one was unable to be here. Her name is Carol Montoya. She's a senior at Western Heights High School. Uh, the second one is Rose Wynn. She is a junior at Western Heights High School. Uh, she is in student council and on the superintendent's honor roll for maintaining a 4.0 GPA. Rose looks to widen understandings and see vast career opportunities in the Federal Reserve Bank by serving on the Federal Reserve Student Board of Directors. She also volunteers at Feed the Children. Rose identifies three problems that the youth of Oklahoma City face as a lack of understanding in our education system, teenage pregnancy, and youth's apathy towards school. She wants to see these issues addressed by informing youth and their families about changes in the education system, better sex education, and by implementing a program of young adult mentors to help youth realize the importance of school. Rose, congratulations. Well, these positions are highly sought and you compete against other students around the city. So congratulations on achieving this. And I hope you'll work closely with your council member through the upcoming school year. I know they also have parents and support people that are in the audience today. Would you all please stand so we can show our appreciation to what you've done to help mold these young people? And to make it official, we will need a motion on item 3E. Aye. Second. All right, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Congratulations to all of you. Look forward to working with you. Item 4 is the Journal of Council Proceedings. 4A is to receive the journal for August 1st, and 4B is to approve the journal for July 18th. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 5 is request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, outside of uh, item 9A3, which is a listed withdrawal on the agenda, I've got two items on page 26 under items 9H1. 9H1 on page 26, item C, 1233 Northeast 6th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And then uh, item 9I1, uh, item C, 1233 Northeast 6th Street. We ask that that be stricken. Again, the owner has secured. All right, any other requests for uncontested continuances? Item 6 is revocable permits. The first request is from the Capitol Hill Assembly of God who is hoping to host the Convoy of Hope OKC event on October 7th in Woodson Park. Uh, Justina Wagner here to tell us more about it. Good morning, Justina. Good morning. We'll Thank need you your so name much. and address for the record, please. Uh, Justina Wagner, my address is 13604 Calabria Trail in Oklahoma City, and I am here on behalf of Capitol Hill Assembly of God. 2400 Southwest 74th Street. Also with me is Dr. Eddie Brewer, the senior pastor at Capitol Hill Assembly of God. Cool. Convoy of Hope is a Christian humanitarian organization began in 1994 um, doing 
pretty much what we're going to be doing at Woodson Park. They have since expanded over the last 20 years to include um, worldwide hunger relief, worldwide education, and worldwide disaster relief. They sound kind of familiar to you. They were here on the ground in May of 2013, immediately following the more tornadoes. As a matter of fact, they are still on the ground in more helping more rebuild people there, rebuild their lives. On October 7th, Convoy of Hope will be rolling into Oklahoma City with over a million dollars in food, goods, and services to be distributed to those in need for free. Included in that is 80,000 pounds of food, gardens in a bag, um, National Breast Cancer Foundation will be here to hand out um, uh, certificates for uh, free breast exams. We will have um, free food. We're going to be providing a free lunch, um, photography, hairstyle or haircuts, uh, kid zone, gardens in a bag, the full effect. Walgreens will be here with, um, I'm thinking, <laughs> Walgreens will be here with um, vaccines. We have about 18 churches right now coming on board with more um, coming on just about every week. We have the full support of the um, Oklahoma District of the Assemblies of God, Capital Baptist Association, and the International Pentecostal Holiness Churches, along with um, City Rescue Mission, the Baptist um, Mission on Exchange is also one of our supporters, and the Green family. Well, Justina, thank you, and uh, please uh, thank all the congregations that are being a part of it. There's certainly a need for these types of items, and we rely on the faith-based organizations a lot, so we appreciate you stepping up. You're welcome. Is there a motion on item 6A? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Thanks again. Item 6B is a little unusual. It's uh, to conduct three-dimensional seismic survey encompassing rights of way. Yes. What is that? It, it's, it's the same process. It's, it's a revocable permit. It's the same process. It's just not for an event. It's for them to be in our right of way to accomplish these tasks. Okay. So it's the Water Utilities Trust and, and a city. couple of private sector organizations working to conduct this seismic survey. I'll need a motion. All right. We're voting on 6B, and it passes unanimously. We're assessed the council meeting convened as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are two items. Make that three items all right six items actually we have a motion and a second any comments or questions on the MFA all right cast your votes it passes unanimously well adjourn the OC MFA convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority five items here is there a motion cast your votes it passes unanimously We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on the EAT. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, are there any individual considerations? All right, ready to vote the consent docket? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. On to the concurrence docket. All right. Is there any individual comments anyone wants to make on the concurrence docket? We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. That moves on to item nine. These are items that require a separate vote. We'll start with a series of zoning cases. The first is an ABC issue in Ward 2. The address is 3033 North May Avenue. Ed? If no one signed up to speak, I move for approval. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A1. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A2 is a zoning case in Ward 7. It's also an ABC issue, and the address is 2727 Northeast 63rd. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Madam Clerk, has anyone signed up to speak? Um, the Planning Commission did approve uh, this uh, application on June the 22nd. Um, there was no protest. With that said, I move for approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 9A2. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A3 was withdrawn at the beginning of the council meeting. On to item 9A4, which is a ABC issue in Ward 6. The address is 5301 Southwestern Avenue. 
Is the applicant for this item here? All right. In uh, Meg's absence, does anyone want to make a motion on item 9A4? Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A5 is a zoning case in Ward 4. It's an ABC issue. And the address is 436 Southwest 59th Street. Thank you, Your Honor. Has anyone signed up to speak yes. in this? With that, I would move for approval. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A5. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A6 is a zoning case in Ward 7. It's currently R1 single family residential, and it would be moving into a planned unit development district. The address is 2844 Northeast 23rd. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam Clerk. Anyone signed up to speak? No one signed up to speak. Uh, the um, Planning Commission uh, did uh, approve this with uh, TEs, and according to staff report, the uh, applicant has agreed to uh, the TEs. Is anyone here present uh, want to speak on this uh, item? Um, with that said, uh, Mr. Mayor, I move for approval. Second. We're voting on item 9A6. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A7 is a zoning case in Ward 1. The address is 11020 West Memorial. It's currently inside a plan unit development, and they would be creating a new PUD if approved. John? I mean, James? Yeah, this, uh, uh, this is for a Piedmont School District for an uh, early childhood education center. Um, the PUD that it's within now has an R1 base. It still will have an R1 base. It just adds child care centers uh, to the list of, of things that can, go, that can uh, to the list of uses. So it, it had a planning commission approval and uh, staff recommended approval. So if nobody signed up, I recommend approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 9A7. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A8 is a zoning case in Ward 1 at 12017 Northwest Expressway. It's currently inside a spud, and it would be a new spud if approved. James? Yeah, this is for a Brahms on Northwest Expressway. Um, it got planning commission approval also, and uh, um, not, not, uh, not the, uh, the other Brahms on Northwest Expressway that, <laughs> that I, that, the, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> This one's out on, uh, on Piedmont Road, Piedmont Road, Northwest Expressway, out in Canadian County. So um, uh, with that, I uh, move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A8. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Item 9A9 is a zoning case in Ward 6. The address is 2732 Northwest 20th Street. It's currently R2, medium low density, and it would become a new spud if approved. Is there anyone here representing this? Land. Yeah, come on up. Good My morning. Tell Fallon. us what you have planned here on Northwest 20th. Okay, Fallon Brooks, 2732 Northwest 30, 27th. 20th. I don't even know my own address. Um, we are tearing down the existing garage um, and building a new garage with an apartment above it for rental income. Um, and we'll also house an art studio out of the back. Um, the homeowner, who is my roommate and business partner, is a local artist, and uh, so kind of want to bring some. Some the idea is to have uh, to be able to rent it to like another local artist and kind of have share that studio space and do all that. So, pretty, pretty cool idea. Yeah, sounds like an interesting idea. Is there a motion on item nine A nine? All right, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Thanks Thank and good luck. Item 9A10 is a zoning case in Ward 4 at 7501 South Shields Boulevard. It's currently in a spud and they're wanting to create a new spud. Thank you, Your Honor. Has anyone signed up to speak against this? Uh, it was approved by the Planning Commission. The spud really just, uh, the change to this spud really just allows them to have their signage back after some work was completed on 240 and they lost the sign that had been there for 10 years. So with that, I would move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A10. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A11 is a zoning case in Ward 2 on Northwest 43rd Street. It's currently R1 single family, and it would be put into a new spud. Ed? 
Has anybody signed up to speak? Or? Can I ask, David, are you representing you know, Paul? Can I ask you a question about... So what, what happens if we don't Paul rezone Lefevre. What happens if we don't rezone it? This is just correcting a, uh, uh, a zoning violation that has existed for years. Uh, the two parties are uh, working on the sale of the parking area, both tracks, from the church to the school. Okay. This uh, solves mutual problems they have, but there are easements uh, and agreements that allow the church to use it in the in the future for parking. So it's uh, it's it's addressing a number of of issues for both organizations uh, in uh, in bringing this into uh, uh, compliance with the uh, municipal code. So the, the the reason I ask is, I mean, I have concerns which have been in the media, and James just brought up one of the the principal conflicts right now is is. Uh, after millions and millions of dollars that we've spent on Western Avenue, we continue to have this proliferation of residential lots being rezoned into uh, to allow surface parking lots. And it's just, it's businesses up and down Western trying to do that. I've met with Westminster School before. We've had concerns because they're buying houses around their surface parking lot. And I certainly have a concern that at one point Westminster would tear down those houses and extend their surface parking lot. Would this, would this sale uh, obviate, is that the right, it, would it do away with the need potentially for Westminster to potentially expand their existing surface parking lots? It's my understanding, yes, but uh, we do have the, the headmaster here, if you'd like him to address that issue. He wouldn't mind. <laughs> My name's Bob Vernon, head of Westminster School. Uh, your, your question, Ed, is? is there's concern within the neighborhood, Douglas right. Edgemere, that the houses that Westminster School has purchased contiguous with your surface parking lots, that one day you may tear those down and try and turn those into surface parking lots to expand your existing surface parking right. lot. With this rezoning, does that do away with the pressure on sure. expanding the kind of the northern parking lot. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, we spent uh, thirty-five or forty thousand uh, dollars renovating that house, which is across from Douglas Park. It's at Forty-fifth and uh, Lee, right, on the southwest corner, next to our parking lot across from the school. We spent forty-five thousand dollars re-developing uh, that, and it's currently being rented to a faculty member. She moved in on August first. Fantastic. So it's in I, a great location, and it's a great house. Right. So yeah. she'll be across from the park. Okay. So, I mean, my, my only concern is with precedent. I mean, we're going to have a, a high-conflict case come before the council where Brahms wants to, for houses that were torn down, and then they want to tear down another house, and then they, they want to rezone those residential lots into a spud to allow a huge surface parking lot to allow a drive-through for a, for a Brahms fast food restaurant. And uh, there are others, you know, the owner of a, a chicken restaurant wants to buy the house from an 82-year-old woman behind and tear down her house and make, and then we've had the issue with the dry cleaners, which I under, we're, we're, we've got a development occurring there, and we passed the spud, we had the same kind of conflict, so. But this, this use has been there for, for many, many for, years. For decades. For decades. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, so I move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. And item 9A11 passes unanimously. Thank you. 9A12 is a zoning case in Ward 7, 4402 and 4404 South Magnolia Avenue. It's currently R1 single family and C1 neighborhood commercial, and it would be put into a new spud. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Madam Clerk, anyone signed up to speak? The Planning Commission did approve it um, with the TEs. The applicant has agreed to the TEs. Uh, with that said, I move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A12. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. 
Item 9B is an ordinance that's before the council for the final time. This is an issue that has to do with War Acres and their inability to, to co collect utility payments and it's up for a final hearing today. Council's already been briefed on this item. Is there a motion on item 9B? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9C is a public hearing. This has to do with on-street parkings and the regulations that associate that. Is there anyone here that's hoping to speak on the public hearing today on item 9C? All right, how about a motion then to move this toward a final hearing? All right, cast your votes on 9C. It passes unanimously. Item 9D is a public hearing, and this would also have to do with the same issue as previous, uh, but has to do with the fees. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on the, the public hearing as to the fees on the uh, changes that we're going to make in on-street parking? Okay. Is there a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9E is an ordinance that's going to be introduced today, and uh, Sean Thompson is here. LaShawn Thompson is here this morning to, to uh, talk to us about this proposed ordinance. Good morning, Mayor and Council. LaShawn Thompson, Court Administrator. Today I'm here to introduce an ordinance as a result of legislative changes to increase state mandated fees. The Oklahoma City Municipal Court is required by state statutes to collect fees on behalf of the state, CLEAT, APHIS, and forensic fees. For any citation over $10 except for parking and standing violations. There has been a state fee assessment totaling $19. Now that will increase to a total of $30. The fees are mandatory with the city functioning as a pass-through between the convicted defendant and the state. Thank you for allowing me to introduce this ordinance and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, any questions for LaShawn? Item just being introduced today, there'll be a public hearing on August 29th and a final hearing that is currently scheduled for September 12th. Is there a motion to allow this to be introduced and move it forward? All right, cast your votes and it passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 9F is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9F? All right, how about a motion? Is there a second? Your, Your Honor, can, yeah. could uh, we look at item E real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, item D, which is? Uh, e, uh, 134th Terrace. Okay. 8325, is it Northwest 134? Yeah. All right. Do we know how long that's been since that thing was hit by lightning? Uh, we do not. I mean, it's, um, let's see if we have a fire report on it. I was just curious. I don't show, I don't show a fire report on it, so I'm not sure. And I know, I know they're still trying to work through with the insurance company on this. Should they just contact you in regards to that? Yes, that, that happens all the time. We work with everybody on that. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second on item 9F. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any of these items? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9G is a public hearing regarding a dilapidated structure in the HP Landmark District. It's in Ward 2 at 412 Northwest 26th Street. Ed, you okay with this? All right, is, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on this item? All right, Ed, you want to make the motion? Cast your votes on item 9G1. And it passes unanimously, and then we need another motion on 9G2. All right, cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. Item 9H is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9H? All right, we're voting on item 9H. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9L is a public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. I. You're right, 9I. Is, 9I is a public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. Is there a motion here? Is there anyone here hoping to speak on any of these items? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And 9J is a public hearing regarding the removal of properties from the abandoned building list. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on these items? All right, we're voting on 9J. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. 
Item 9K is a resolution that has to do with the boundaries of Manuel Perez Park, and I think Doug Cupper is here to explain the nuance. Good morning, Mayor, City Council, Doug Cupper, Director of Parks and Recreation and Cultural Services. Uh, back in, in October of 2016, we came before City Council to uh, relocate the Manuel Perez name uh, for a park into a portion of, of the uh, eastern portion of Wiley Post Park. Uh, it was a unanimous decision by the council. Unfortunately, in reviewing the documents, uh, I failed to review the map that was presented to this council. It left out a fairly large chunk of what we had anticipated to make part of Manuel Perez going forward. Uh, as we work through the design with the neighborhood and the, and the uh, South Chamber folks and the Hispanic community, uh, we realized that we had left a 10-acre parcel out. So uh, the Board of Park Commissioners recommends that this be added. The uh, River Trust recommends that this be added. So we're asking the City Council to uh, make the correction and add these, these 10 acres to the Manuel Perez Park holdings. Be happy to answer any questions. Your Honor, I would, before we vote, I would just like to once again uh, commend you for your work with the community down there and, and trying to make this park really fit into the neighborhood. And it's just going to be a great addition down there on the south bank of the river. So thank you. Thank you. Is, is this park really in three different wards? <laughs> yeah, 10 acres right on the edge. That's there. crazy. <laughs> All right, we're um, voting on item 9K. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9L, I understand we do not need executive session. That's correct. So a motion is in order. Cast your votes. 9L, passage unanimously. Item 9M, I understand we do not need executive session, so a motion to approve would be in order. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Likewise, on item 9N, I understand we do not need executive session. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. 9-0, I understand we do need executive session. So, all right, how about a motion to move item 9-0 into executive session? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9-P, I understand we do need executive session. All right, is there a motion there? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9-Q is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9-Q? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Item 10 is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on any of these items? All right, how about a motion to approve the claims? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item 11 is items from council. Mark, you want to get us started? Thank you, Your Honor. Just briefly, uh, September 12th, we have a very important election coming up. I would encourage people to go to OKC.gov and review these issues about roads, police, and fire. And I'd also encourage everyone to please vote. Thank you. All right. John? All right. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I was going to see if Boyd could come out. And uh, here he comes. Uh, with all the uh, rain we've been having recently, everybody's very pleased with that. But there is sometimes problems associated with that and it's just a reminder the best way to about uh, mosquitoes and uh, cautions that uh, we all can use to help minimize the risk that mosquitoes pose to us so boyd would you mind playing the that best game? way to prevent west nile and other mosquito-borne illnesses fight the bite wear long sleeves and pants when you're outdoors and use insect repellents with deet clear gutters of debris and drain standing water from objects in your yard, like bird baths, kids' toys, and wheelbarrows. Keep mosquitoes out of your home by fixing window and door screens, and avoid traveling to Zika-affected areas, especially if you're pregnant or planning to become pregnant. To learn more, visit fightthebiteok.com. Thanks, Boyd. I think the uh, City County Health Department's going to begin making uh, further announcements later this week, uh, but areas uh, as you might suspect, close to standing water, such as ponds and creeks, tend to uh, uh, be a good habitat for mosquitoes. 
areas around golf courses tend to also have a large number of mosquitoes. So just be careful and try to uh, just do those simple reminders. Thank you, Your All Honor. Right. Thanks, David. Todd? Larry? Ed? James? All right. City manager reports. Uh, we'll start out with the presentation on the uh, revenue enforcement program for uh, July 16th through June 17th. Matt Boggs is here to make that presentation this morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Matt Boggs, uh, Assistant City Treasurer in the City Treasurer's Office in the Finance Department. And essentially just giving you our annual update on the Revenue Enforcement Program. That is essentially our program that was started in 2001 where we take a closer look at sales tax, use tax, as well as some of the other revenues that do come into the city just to make sure that we are getting the uh, correct amounts and working with the Tax Commission and other applicable entities to do that. The, the biggest question we always get is, so how much do we collect this year? The, the revenue for fiscal year 2017 was around $800,000. Uh, if you've paid attention to this uh, program, it, it fluctuates. It's been as much as $2 million in the past. Last year, it was in the $790,000 range. So about a 2% increase over last year. The other applicable question is, well, how much did it cost? The uh, estimated cost was about $542,000, and so we've got a Revenue over cost about 260000 for this program for fiscal year 2017. Now, this was an interesting year for our collections, and so we'll take a look at what made up that 800000 next. Uh, as long as I've been here and as the many years I went back and looked, we have never had a year where our hotel tax collections was our highest generator inside of this program. And we've got a couple of reasons for that this year. Um, one is going to be we did have a uh, hotel that had been operating, not remitting any hotel tax for a number of months that uh, uh, we discovered and uh, got them to start remitting and so that created a big chunk. We've had a few large hotels that have been extremely delinquent and needed some additional follow-up this fiscal year, which kind of started to boost those numbers up a little bit more. And then finally, um, if, you had, if you read the city manager report in the last council meeting for the hotel tax, um, for the quarter, we have three hotels that are in promissory notes where they had been delinquent, and so we have uh, put together a promissory note plan for them to pay off uh, those amounts. All those contributing factors led to uh, hotel tax collections making up about 65% of our collections this year. Uh, that should not be the case going forward. Uh, one of the new things we've had in our office is uh, we now, hotels have the ability to pay their hotel taxes online. And a benefit that that has brought us is any math errors are now eliminated from this. Any, a lot of those exemptions, trying to take erroneous exemptions, were eliminated. The uh, app went live January the 1st, so just in that six months, we've seen a 20% decrease in the number of correction invoices that we send out. I would expect that number to go higher. We've got a little over 50% of our hotels using that, and so I would imagine this number will go down significantly next year. Going on to sales tax compliance, uh, I'll go back to that other slide. Uh, that's 126,000. What that's going to be is any time that we, through our regular analysis, identify taxpayers that appear like they're not remitting the correct amount. That can also be instances where a great example this year, our budget director had a receipt that he pulled in from a business that was in Oklahoma City, charged him the wrong rate, and we checked with the tax commission. They had been remitting to another city for the last 11 months, and so we got 11 months collections worth of that. So those, those are the type of things that come in that area. COPO audit collections is um, another one taken, it's worth taking a look at. It was only about $25,000 this year, and that has been significant in years past, and that has dwindled down to a very small amount. And the biggest reason for that is the Oklahoma Tax Commission now has most of their new taxpayers going online, and so it bounces it off their database essentially when they come through. So we're not seeing as many of the boundary issues as we did before. And finally, we've got the independent auditor collections. That's where we contract with two independent auditors who take a look at individual sales tax considerations. Uh, it was 126,000. The cost for that was about 45,000, which means for every dollar we spend, we get about another $2.75 back. Now, one thing to note with that, we have three large audits that were assessed this year that are still in protest with the tax commission. Especially with your larger amounts, it's not uncommon for the taxpayer to ask for the full protest, maybe come up with additional support, ask for different types of um, 
extensions and whatnot. So we typically, with larger audits, can see six, nine, 12, even 15 month delay from when the audit is assessed to when we make the collection. Those three audits that have been assessed but not collected amount to about $400,000. Now what we get in the end, maybe less than that, just due to um, a good negotiations with penalty and interest and whatnot, but uh, those are still outstanding at this time. Now, a question you may ask is, so some of these are dwindling that we've seen just because of how the tax commission has changed their processes. Well, what are, you, what are we doing from there? And so we do have a couple of new uh, projects that we've worked on this year that we hope to report to you next year, and we'll take a look at that. One is the area of property tax, something that we've never really taken a look at. And uh, throughout this year, we did identify in Oklahoma County around 85 properties that should have been paying property tax to Oklahoma City, but were not. We actually worked with the Oklahoma County Assessor's Office. They put that in their uh, assessment roles for the upcoming year. Uh, that should yield us about $27,000 this year and for the years to come. Uh, we're hoping to expand that analysis to uh, Cleveland County in the next coming months. Deliveries to Oklahoma City, this is one area where uh, during the last few years we identified a suburban furniture store that had never remitted any taxes to Oklahoma City, yet on their website they clearly say they make deliveries to Oklahoma City, so they should have been paying those taxes. We saw that as a risk area, and so we worked with the tax commission. They actually created a new report for Oklahoma City that allows us to take a look at that. We just got it last week, and so we're excited to dive into it. That addresses that risk area for those businesses located in the surrounding communities that are in industries that have a high number of deliveries, yet are not paying the taxes on those goods that were delivered into Oklahoma City. Can I ask you a question? Can we back up? Why, why would a property owe their property tax to the city of Oklahoma City? Like what, what are these 85 properties? Uh, well, because in general, for our general obligation bonds, the, uh, that's how it's paid for the ad valorem assessment. So there's a, a amount that's assessed on your property taxes, especially for individuals. These were uh, individual houses that it, it appeared what had happened was there were, they had been grandfathered in from some of the original tract of land, was maybe a large agricultural property, and as it was split out, that piece that would come to Oklahoma City was never apportioned in from the tax commission. And, and we saw odd cases to where there were next door neighbors. One was in a taxing district that would pay Oklahoma City. The other one was not, even though they were next door neighbors. So it's just our portion. Yes, we that's, that's correct. Okay. It was where certain taxing districts, like let's say there may be one who it would pay Oklahoma City Public Schools, the city of Oklahoma City, the, the libraries, Votex, whatnot. But for that particular one, certain taxing districts will be left out one area for like, let's say city taxes will be left out, so. Well, and, and there's also a, a sales tax for the utilities as well. Would, would that apply? Like for, for you know, if-, if that, that was not 18. in the scope of this analysis that we did, yeah. because this was specifically looking at those that had been identified that should have been, pay, should have been in a taxing district that would pay Oklahoma City. In order okay. So um, next, uh, and we came before you uh, two weeks ago sharing with the uh, home sharing uh, agreement. Our office works pretty closely with Airbnb to get our agreement uh, set in place with them. They're going to, should be uh, making their first remittances no later than October 15th. Uh, we're currently working with them to get them to be set up to use our system and to pay our taxes and uh, how they have everything working with that. And we have also been approached by other uh, people who are listing on other home sharing websites who are wanting to pay their taxes to Oklahoma City, and so that would be included in that program as well. Uh, the last two items, cigarette tobacco, and tobacco tax, is something that we've never really looked at. Uh, it was something the city auditor suggested we should take a look at. It's a pretty complicated formula, and it's a, uh, something that we've never really dove into, and so we're, that's gonna be a goal for the upcoming years to take a look at that, make sure Oklahoma City is getting the correct amount, make sure the calculation is being done correct. And finally, use tax, uh, as you know, is one of the most sporadic taxes that we have. Um, we have taken a look at it in a way so we can break down the data into a more manageable amount because certain remittances should be more consistent like a sales tax, whereas others may be, still be sporadic and we're still looking at other ways to identify that. But just by breaking down the use tax into smaller pieces, 
we're hoping we can take a look at the analysis in such a way that we could uh, receive those co collections. And uh, with that, we can uh, take any other questions you might have. Just one question. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, OTC protests that can sometimes take up to 15 months. Do we have a policy on the waiver of penalty and interest in an effort to try to get those settled quicker? Uh, that is not on us. That is on the Tax Commission. Uh, what they do, they will send us a letter. Uh, it's actually part of the contract between the state, the Oklahoma Tax Commission, and each individual city. Uh, they will let us know if there's going to be any sort of waiver of penalty and interest. And for the most part, uh, they've gone through their process. Usually they're gonna only gonna do that waiver if they've made their good faith payments on the principal portions of that. So typically on the principal and interest, we would like to get at least the amount of interest that we would have received on our investment portfolio. That's kind of the, we have a standing letter that we send out that we ask, hey, we would like the interest to be at least what we're earning right now because that's what, something we should have earned. But for the most part, we'll go with what the tax commission says. But we do have the option to bring that before the tax commission if we have any sort of protest. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Art, there's a oh, go ahead. Go, uh, just a general amnesty program that begins in September again. Uh, it generates quite a bit of revenue whenever they offer that. So all penalties and interest will be waived at the state level beginning in September for about, it's either a month or 60 days. I do have a couple of questions. Um, so the situation where a, a uh, taxpayer remitted the uh, sales tax or one of these taxes to the wrong municipality? Yes, that's correct. What's the process? Do we just contact that municipality and they transfer the funds to us? Or do we bring the taxpayer into the situation? We actually contact the Oklahoma Tax Commission. And what they will do is they will handle that through their processes, and then we will start receiving uh, those amounts. For this particular one, it was verified that they changed their tax rates. And so for any other future purchases, they would come to Oklahoma City, and they also paid their back taxes. In this particular case, it was around 11 months. And it may be different for something who, someone who had been doing it for three years. That process may take a little bit longer. But we've got to the point to where we're identifying these much quicker than has been in the past, and a lot of that has to do with the Oklahoma Tax Commission's reporting uh, processes and how they've improved on the registration side, which has really um, sped things up in that regard. Okay, so now this is a question, just a theoretical issue, uh, but whenever you have any kind of a tax system, you, you look at the cost to administer that system in evaluating it. If we compare the independent audit program its cost to us is about a third, 36% of the amount of additional revenue that we claim, which is a pretty good return. Now, when we take into account all of the internal enforcement programs, the cost goes up quite a bit to almost two thirds of the cost of the revenue that we uh, generate. Can you find out, maybe not today, but sometime in the future, to see how that compares with prior year's cost and benefit on our internal audits of, of these various tax programs? Absolutely. I mean, is it consistently two-thirds of the revenue that we uh, generate? And one thought is, as long as you're getting in more revenue than it costs, you know, let's keep that program going, but on the other hand, are there ways that we could make it a little bit simpler uh, for the taxpayers to understand where the enforcement issue isn't uh, perhaps necessary? Absolutely. On the other hand, in, without enforcement activity, people tend to be a little bit more laxed and, and do not do as good of a job. So anyway, it would just be interesting to see how our costs compared to the revenue generated for the prior years. Absolutely, and we, we can take a look at that. And it does tend to fluctuate because you just go back two years, uh, the COPO audit collection was around $1.2 million just in one fiscal year, which is more than we had for this entire, entire fiscal year between the four different programs. Yeah. So it, uh, it ebbs and flows based on both the way the taxpayers are doing things and the right. processes with the Oklahoma Tax Commission. The thing to note is we're still getting those taxes that the Tax Commission, when they yeah. change there. No, that's good. And it, it just might going forward be helpful to look at it not so much on a standalone year basis, but look at a uh, an average of the last three to five years as far as revenues generated and the we, cost. We, we can easily put that, that together. Thank you.
Can, can you tell me one more time about what on the cigarette and tobacco tax? That okay. I what, are, what exactly are you doing? Uh, essentially, this was, this was a recommendation from the city auditor's office that we essentially just take a look at it because we've spent a lot of our time in the realm of sales tax and use tax, which is understandable because it's our largest revenue source. Uh, but with the cigarette and tobacco tax, we had never really done any sort of enforcement, recalculation, uh, any of those type of things like that. So really, this is a bare bones just starting to take a look at it to get an understanding of the remittances and the calculations because we just want to make sure that the correct amount is being assessed and that Oklahoma City is receiving is it like I'm, I'm not familiar is it a regular sales tax or is there a percentage that goes to the city of Oklahoma City there would be there's there's a formula with how that goes and the formula is actually based on the sales tax between what your prior um, collections were over the year and it, there's also a formula that goes into that's the comparison of the state cities the counties and the overall tax comparisons it's a fairly complicated formula, especially when you compare it to the sales tax, which is a straight consumption. So it's tax. different than the sales tax formula. Yes. It, it very much is. When they did the compact on cigarette taxes, I don't remember, five, seven years ago, somewhere back in that, that change, we, didn't, we got cut out as being part of the sales tax on cigarettes. So we get an excise tax that comes back from the state on the cigarettes based upon the, the formula that Matt described that's, that's a, a little convoluted, quite frankly. But but we were uh, promised that we would be made whole at that point in time, and it's close to whether we were made whole on it or not. It, it, it's not terribly often being whole, but it, it, it may not be exactly being, being made whole on it. Cities are preempted from doing their own excise tax, or? That would be a question for Mr. Jordan. I would think so, but I don't know that. Okay. All right, any other questions? Thanks very much. Mayor, we also have in the packet the uh, June of 17 quarterly investment report, and then we also have the August sales and use tax collections report. And I want to talk about that for just a minute because if you take a look at it, it's up 5.8% for sales tax, and you're thinking that, that's really good. And that is good, but I want to keep things in perspective because if you take a look at the first page on, on the report, it's up 5.8% over last year. So you go back to August of 16 and you see that 6% below the previous year. So with this 5.8%, we're still two tenths of a percent below August of, uh, uh, of 15. And so I just want to temper our enthusiasm on that a little bit as we go forward. It's good. It's a lot better than what we've had. It's, it, it's over our target for projections this year. But just remember that we, we, we're coming out of a hole. And so we're not out of that hole as of yet. And then one other thing um, that we kind of went over quickly this morning, on the consent docket, consent docket, and I just want to highlight that, item 7BG on the consent docket was a safer grant. And that's for the fire department to provide for some staffing. And that was, we talked about that as part of the budget uh, presentation that, that we would backfill these positions and hopefully get a safer grant to do that. And we did a, a, get the safer grant uh, to fill the fire positions and it's $4.7 million. And so with that, we, we just got word of that. And so with that, we will uh, we'll, we'll be again getting those uh, positions filled. And so that's, that's really good news for us uh, as we go forward. Is that an annual grant or a one-time? It's a three-year grant and it decreases over time. And so it's more the first year and less the second they, year and less the third They year. wean us off. They wean us off. That's okay. correct. All right. Anything else in city manager reports? No, sir. All right. Citizens to be heard. Ronnie Kirk has signed up. Ronnie? <clears throat> Council, my name is Ronnie Kirk. I live at 2328 North Missouri. I was here but two weeks ago, trying to get a gate removed at what, which was called Stringle Pearls Park on 23rd and Sooner Road. Over the weekend, a lot of people came by, said, Ron, the gate's open, the gate's open. Boy, that gate ain't been open that long in two years. Everybody was happy. So I said, well, we can't jump conclusions. 
I gotta go to a city council meeting Tuesday so I can see if the city had it open or they left it open by mistake. We don't make, want to make no wrong decisions and just start going down there. So I said, I told everybody, I was supposed to return here this morning to see what the city council had came up with after I gave them all the documents I had and uh, information I had collected over 20 years. And I passed them all out to the city council members so you could read them. I also went to uh, Oklahoma City Police Department at a Metro, uh, and uh, we never could get a response. We just got a phone number, but they never called back. So I went personally down to the main police department and talked to Miss Megan Morgan over the Office of Information Communication for, for Oklahoma City. And she said, if you had any problem, we're just to have you call her and she'll get, let you know that in the 20 years we went down there, we didn't have no police response. And so I'm here today to see what the council had decided on helping us get the area, the recreation area, open back up. I drove down through there last night just for a found check about 9 o'clock, pulled up there, the gates were pushed all the way back all the way back like they used to be. So I'm standing here before you this morning. And your question is, did we open it on yes. purpose or did we open, leave it oh, open accidentally? Mistake. I don't know that we have a, an answer for that this morning. Do you want to see if you can check into that? And get We'd back be happy. I, I don't know the specifics. I wasn't here two, two weeks ago when you were here, but I'd be happy to look into that. We'll get back with you and find out what the status is. That'd be just fine. And also, Thank you. about two weeks ago, a group came from California, Denver, or somewhere, and they gave a, down on a, a on 10th and uh, on Northeast 10th Street. There's about two or three thousand people down there. They was in the area that we first went to 20 years ago <laughs> to see about going to, but it was our, our second choice. Our first choice was on 23rd and Sooner Road which looked like a nice beach area. You could fly kikes down there. You could um, build sandcastles kind of down there with your kids. And you could really, and the water just three feet deep, and you could put tubes up there. Or the one parent get on one end, let the little kid just float. And that's the area that we preferred to go to. It was real nice. It's still nice today. But the other group came from wherever they came from, uh, they, uh, all the correct signs were put back up. Those great big large stones, you block the blocks off, bring removed. They're not even there now. And the correct signs are there now where it says recreation area. All right. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Anyone else under citizens to be heard? All right. We have executive session. We'll be back. <laughs>